Hello and welcome to the Enterprise Excellence Network webinar series. Um, today we're joined by Tracy and Ernie Richardson um, alongside Professor Peter Hines. Tracy and Ernie um, today will be speaking on the topic of is culture change easier than we thought? And just before we get started, um, I just wanted to give you a bit of background into who we are at the Enterprise Excellence Network. Um, so we are a members only arena for senior lean leaders in Europe founded by Professor Peter Hines, um, and the network includes quarterly benchmarking events at best practice um, and award-winning host sites. So these work workshops are commonly held over two days um, with topics driven by the members and led by Peter Hines. If you'd like to find out a bit more about this, you can email myself. Um, a follow-up email will be sent after the webinar, or you can visit our website, um, which is the enterpriseexcellencenetwork.com. So um, the webinar will consist of a 30-minute presentation by Tracy and Ernie, and then there's a dedicated 30-minute Q&A session at the end, um, which is where we'll ask you to ask most of your questions then. If there is a burning question that you have, um, please feel free to, to type that into the questions tab and we'll do our best to, um, to read those out to Tracy and Ernie. Okay, so now I'm going to hand over to Professor Peter Hines, who will just explain a bit more about the webinar series um, and introduce you to Tracy and Ernie as well. Thank you. And um, yes, good afternoon, good morning, good night, whatever, wherever you are in the world. It's good to uh, have so many of you to be able to join us again. Um, I think this is about the eighth in our webinar series, something like that, um, which we've been doing over the last uh, a uh, few months and uh, there'll be future events which we'll post uh, to you in the same way you found out about this one. Um, this session is uh, run by uh, Tracy and Ernie and it's around this book which uh, they'll be talking about in the, in the next slide. And uh, Tracy and Ernie have uh, some extremely good experience uh, particularly working at Toyota in Kentucky, which uh, reminds me, I don't think we met when I did a research visit there in uh, about 1993 before starting some work on supplier development uh, in the UK. But um, certainly um, the, the book they're going to talk about received a, a Shingo Publication Award recently, and uh, I think you'll be uh, very intrigued by what they're saying. Um, now, because of some climate uh, issues that are going on in Florida at the moment, and uh, also a tree being sawn down at the moment. We're just going to do this on audio, um, but uh, they are both uh, going to be with us. So um, with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, uh, Tracy and Annie. Yes, uh, thanks Peter and Emma for, for having us. Uh, we're very excited to uh, be here with you guys this afternoon for you guys, this morning for us, as you say. Uh, different times for everyone, but uh, glad to share our thoughts uh, around uh, culture change uh, and and mostly around our work, but also uh, with the, the current uh, situation uh, with COVID, the, the culture change that we've had to deal with. And, and so we're going to kind of take you through a, a six or seven slide journey that talks a lot about uh, some of the infrastructure around it and Ernie and I are going to be tag teaming if you will uh, some of the information and he and I may even chime in on each other's slides and, and add to it so uh, we'll be going back and forth and as uh, Peter said if you guys have questions that uh, you want clarified we'll be able to do that uh, at the end as we go through but hopefully we'll be able to uh, give you some value add and some uh, translatable actions or tangible actions that will work uh, for really any level of leader or influencer and uh, anybody that's in continuous improvement uh, arena that wants to look at uh, the culture around that and the infrastructure. So we'll uh, kind of kick it off and I'm gonna let Ernie talk a little bit uh, about this slide around uh, our culture changing in the matter of a couple of weeks. Hello, everyone. So uh, thanks for being here. Uh, do want to talk about culture a little bit because uh, it is it is a struggle when we talk about culture. It is it is uh, companies that we get the opportunity to work with struggle with how to implement change. Uh, I, I tell folks when I when I went to work at Toyota in 1988. Uh, the first day I was there, my trainer started with me working on culture. 
and and I went to Japan and a couple of weeks later and and during that visit I couldn't figure out why I was really there other than I worked a lot it took me several years to come back to reflect on that trip to understand that they're teaching me the basic culture and so I retired there after 25 years, and and at the when I left after 25 years, we're still working on culture. And so it's culture's not a one and done kind of deal. It's not like you you get to the culture you want and then you're finished. It really means that we have to have constant change with culture. And a good example of that just recently is a is a coronavirus issue. If you look at being from uh, Tracy and I work on on uh, continuous improvement and lean. You know, we're watching the process as much as the, the event itself. And we look at looking at the, the, how the culture shifted really, really quick in, in this coronavirus issue. And we started having reflection about if it can shift that quick in this coronavirus. And I know it's, it's, a, it's a very dangerous virus. I, no, there's no doubt about it. But if it can shift that quick, and then we reflect to when we work with companies and they talk about it takes years to change the culture. So we thought about, can we learn something from this? And so we talked about, uh, first of all, it's something when we made this culture change, it's something we had to do. Many times we didn't have an opportunity to say no. And uh, what I'll say about that is, but, but I think the communication from our leaders was very good in explaining why we need to change. Are we, do we want to change? Probably not. Are we willing to change? Absolutely, because we see uh, the data, the, the leading indicator data that shows that we need to make some different uh, uh, decisions on how we live. And when, and when it, as it started ramping up, you could see the conditions actually change dramatically. But as time went on and people started having pressure, then you can see the perspective of the culture shifting. It's not as, as uh, sensitive to them as it was at the beginning. However, if you're in a certain age groups or certain risk area, it's very sensitive to you and your culture stayed the same. So the question is it, it, that we're able to change the culture for this virus very, very quickly. And there will be some sustained culture change from now on. Will it be uh, at the level it is now? Probably not. But will it be at a level that's better uh, from a, a personal perspective in the future? Probably. So think about when we talk about this with a with going to culture and, and working with your companies. It's saying, you know what, we can we can have the culture shift if we're ready for it. And that's a big if, right? Because many people think we can just bring tools in and throw tools like problem solving. We can bring problem solving in and throw it in. But the reality of it is, if you don't have the culture for it, problem solving won't work. If you don't have leaders who understand the purpose behind the problem solving and the purpose behind the culture around the problem solving, it will not work. And so it's really, it's really important to understand that we need to be able to work on the culture to be able to define what do we want to be. And so even, even at Toyota, when I started, as I said, it was a long time working on culture for problem solving before we ever really got into A3 problem solving. And by, honestly, by the time I got to the A3 problem solving, it wasn't a big deal because we were already doing it. And so the culture part is something that we have to work on every single day. Every single day we go in, we can affect the culture positive or negatively. And then we have to help our employees, help our folks that we serve and servant leadership to be able to learn about why culture is important to them and so it really does not take years to make a culture shift but it takes constant everyday opportunities to work on the culture and and to add you know with the and we'll bring the book up some of some of you listening may be familiar with with the book and we'll talk a little bit more about that coming up but when we talk about dna and for us, that's the there's a macro level and a micro, but the discipline accountability, and I say and really fast because it sounds like N, so D N A, but the discipline and accountability for the culture, um, because back in in '88 we didn't really have this word to describe it so much. You know, lean wasn't uh, described in in the way that it is today. And so I tell folks, um, it was very atmospheric 
in ways. It was just in the air. It was what we did. And, and our trainers, our, our Japanese trainers and coordinators and the executive coordinators, you know, they would just more or less say, this is your job. And, and I made a little um, kind of acronym at a job. It's just our behavior. And, you know, if you look at the bullets, you know, we're, we're not going to read all those bullets to you, but talk about them. But the, the fifth one down talks about, you know, the behavior perspective. So every day, if we just look at our behavior, just our behavior, J-O-B, that is our job. That helps us walk that walk and, and understand that perspective. So, you know, when we when we look at, at the things from a leadership perspective as an influencer, um, you know, it, it, it is our choice, but how how disciplined are we to do that every day? And so uh, it, it takes us to ask the questions around, you know, how do we know we need to change from that, that company perspective? Because there's a lot of folks that get into what we call a, a conditioned norm sort of um, action. You know, it's, it's a conditioned response, if you will. And we, we need to step back and ask the questions about, are we meeting the internal and, and external uh, expectations of the, the customer? And, you know, internally, obviously, and, it, and people think it's always about manufacturing that I'm gonna send a quote widget to the next process, where it could be in IT, you know, how many screens do I have to go through to get my output to the next customer, which could be through an invisible computer trail and, and understand the value stream of something invisible. How do we know we're, we're meeting that expectation, which ultimately serves our external customer? And then the question around where's the value Where's the non-value add? And to differentiate in that value stream, you know, what is the, the expectation? And so when we look at creating standards around it, and, and standards can be such a uh, rigid word for folks. You know, we, we sometimes say that and, and we get a, a face from folks when we're, when we're at their Gimba talking about, hey, where's, where's the standard? And they kind of look at us, oh, we have it. And there's this however afterwards to say it's there and people understand it. And our first question is, you know, is it being followed? Do they understand it? Uh, what's the, uh, as I call it, what, what's the macro process we have to do? And what are the small nuances within the standard uh, that there's accountability for? And we find that is the one of the biggest gaps around you know creating the standard is one thing but to have accountability for it takes it to a, a different level and, and sometimes there's not accountability because we don't involve the folks that are doing the work the process owners the they could be on first shift second shift third shift they could be stakeholders you know folks that are part of you know it could be r d having a part of that it could be the, the folks uh, from maintenance, a lot of folks that are stakeholders. We don't necessarily ask them their you know, input from being the professional that has a, a, that process every day doing the work. We don't involve them. So sometimes we create it and the, 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 the buy-in just isn't there. And so I call that, it's a suggestion. And what I mean by that, the standard is just the suggested way to follow it, which can create, uh, if you go into the next bullet, it can create our inability to measure abnormality. If I've got 10 folks that cycle through any process that creates an output, a service, a, a widget, a, you know, you're providing something, you're providing a tangible, and if I'm doing it many different ways, it's very difficult for me to understand uh, a measurable gap if I don't have accountability uh, for that process. And so when we look at measuring uh, the, the, what we say, the ideal state versus the current state, which we'll talk a little bit about as, as we get through, when we, when we look at that, I always like to ask the question of, of folks that we uh, work with, are you 
tracking leading indicators, which if you look at the next bullet, leading is more predictive and, and lagging is more reactive. It's, it's historical. Um, when, we, when we track data to say, you know, what is currently happening to look against our standard or our ideal state, is it lagging information we're reacting to or firefighting to, or are we trying to look upward into the process to say, where can I put in a, a tracking mechanism to be more predictive to the output? And uh, an external example to this, I think everybody can relate to is, is like parking garage. So everybody knows before they go into a parking garage, there's this hanging um, kind of bar and it shows the, the height. And it's kind of like, if you hit this before you get to the garage, you're going to hit the garage. And so it gives you a leading indicator, a predictive indicator to not allow you to, you know, potentially damage, uh, and it's usually larger or higher trucks uh, that may have been modified. So it gives you that indicator. And so in our work life, where can we put those predictive measures within the process to look at, to be able to say X, Y, or Z is happening in this point of the process before we get to the end and have to react and, and not know where to go back because again, going back to that standard, it's not being held with accountability uh, or discipline. And, and I like to say that a standard, a definition, here, here's an easy definition for folks. You know, a standard is the best known method at this moment that we have consensus and agreement to. You know, we've come together and, and created this and that we have accountability to follow until we change it together. Um, in our book, we talk about never sell, tell, or convince anybody of anything, but rather engage and involve. And so I think if you go back to looking at engaging folks and doing those standards, it will help us move from the firefighting predictive, and it helps us understand the, the values and the principles, it gives us that, that guiding beacon, if you will, uh, to look at for our true north. You know, I learned true north, and I'm gonna show you on, on the next slide, I've got an example that I'm gonna walk through quickly. Our true north was taught to me on my hire date, which was August 1st of 1988. And I can recite it today, almost uh, 32 years later, and I'm not an employee. That's how much it was embedded into what we did. It became intrinsic for me. So, you know, is, is your line of sight clear? Is the line of sight clear for all our workers at all levels, you know, cascading our, our Hoshin goals, which is our, our kind of our, our directional management or our strategy deployment, which support our daily management. And, Emma's going to put a poll question out for you, I think, at this time, just to think about as we go through the rest of, of the question, or rest of the presentation, she's going to have a question about, you know, barriers to culture. So you can be thinking about that and, and add some uh, response to that as we go through. But I want to talk about that, that line of sight because I think it's very important for any individual even if you don't lead, you're an influencer in, in my mind. And so as an influencer, I need to ask some questions. And, and this came from, I'll say back in, in 2004, Toyota globally, I'll say from TMC, Toyota Motor Corporation, all the way from Toyota North America and all the, the countries um, they, they pulled kind of a global end on cord and said, you know, we all need to understand our line of sight. And I've shared a, a tidbits of this on LinkedIn for those that, that follow, um, you know, a little bit around these questions, but this was a mandatory set of questions that all, anybody that led had to answer. And at this time, I was a contractor in HR training and development, and I had to answer these questions for, for my role. So I'm going to attempt uh, to make a, a change here in the screen to bring up 
an example here that goes through this the series of questions that that Ernie and I use in our training that gets everyone that's there representing from folks that work at, at process level all the way up to the CEOs of the company, it's important for everybody to understand. And I'm, I'm walking through mine, but as you guys read this, I would like you guys to think Tra about- Tracy, yes, could yes. I just, <clears throat> just interrupt? Um, <clears throat> we've launched the poll now. Should we do the poll first and then we'll do the uh, walkthrough in a minute? Sure. <clears throat> Yes, however you guys, that, that would be fine. Yeah, because the delegates can only see the poll just now. So if we finish that off and we'll come to the... Okay, absolutely, yes. Okay. okay, so we're just waiting for a few more people to um, select their answers. Okay, so the um, oh, we're just getting a few more people voting. Okay, so I think with this, there's been a few um, double selections, which is why the percentages aren't adding up. But it gives you an idea of where the the voting um, lies. So the question: What are the barriers to culture change? We have 29% time. 24% resources, 63% uh, buy-in, and then 92% leadership, which is where I think the double voting has come in. And I'm just jotting down, what was the 63%, the what was the, the wording? I got the time, the resources, and the leadership, what was? And the 63% was buy-in. Buy-in, okay. So if you think uh, think about the results just for a little bit, uh, the time, resources, and buy-in kind of all connect together. When you look at it, it's the aspect of we don't have time uh, to make change, we don't have the resources to make change, and we don't have, I don't understand why we're making the change. And so if you look at those kind of results, and then you go to the last one and talk about leadership, it's usually a reflection of the leadership that is setting the culture for for the people and talking about and most of the time the 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 gap that we see is leaders don't really explain very well what the goals and objectives of the company are and how to get there and so it's more directional leadership of here's what we need to do let's go do it versus the catch ball style and servant leadership of saying Here's where we need to get to. How can you help me get there? How can you help the company get there? I should say. And so, if I can, if I can really uh, thinking about lean culture for a leader is very, very uh, visible, very, very sensitive every single day. Everything they do is viewed. Everything they do is viewed either positively or negatively based upon the condition of the of the current situation. So even, even some days if you walk through the plant and you don't speak to somebody, they're like, well, look here, he's in a bad mood today. That changes the culture for people that day. And so in servant leadership, we got to always get to the point of how do we, how do we serve the people by improving the culture, by setting the, guy, the, the goals and objectives for the company that people understand or are willing to buy into. So it's a really good uh, reflection, I think, of what we see also uh, if we have the leadership that buys into the culture, then we will get the buy-in, we'll get the time, and we'll get the resources. <coughs> Excuse me. Because reality, if we if we get better at what we do and get more efficient at what we do, the time and the resources actually come for us. That's kind of the result. So a really, really good poll question, I think, and really good results. And And, and one thing to add around the time, and it goes back to, you know, value add versus non-value add. So uh, I, I go to a Wooden quote, John Wooden quote. It says, hey, if I don't have time to do it right the first time, when am I going to have time to do it over? And that goes back to firefighting. 
a, a lot of times we see the condition response is to immediately fix with, you know, as we all call the Band-Aid, and that takes time. So oftentimes we do have the time we're, we're choosing in that moment in that, you know, the heat of the moment to look at, oh, well, I need to fix it, but I've also got to keep running and we stay, we tend to stay in that mode. And so I, I want to bring out the point that the time can be there. We just need to do KPI translations to how we're spending it and what are we doing over more than once because you'll hear folks, oh, I've seen this before, here's what we need to do. And my first response is to ask the question, how many times have we seen this before? And then that's where you can start to find in the, in the time category and the resources to kind of change that, that aspect a little bit to, to bring awareness to. So, so as far as my, uh, were you guys able to see this slide uh, when it was up, the, the line of sight questions? Because I'm going to switch back to the, the Word document to go through my example very quickly. I didn't think we saw that slide, so okay. <clears throat> it might be worth yeah, So this is what through. I was talking about in regard to, you know, this is a mandatory exercise within Toyota today that started back in 2004 uh, when the Toyota business practices uh, came about through the Toyota Institute, which was our new, at that time, uh, global problem solving process with many, Many people are familiar with that, some aren't. We write about it in, in our book and, and kind of weave that into the, the equation part. But these five questions were something that every leader needed to understand their connection to what they were doing, their daily work, their role, and how that went up to the true north. And, and again, the true north was, was something that we learned uh, day one. And I'll show you the example of what, what that is in, in this example that Ernie and I use. And I'm just gonna kind of scroll up with it since it's um, a two page uh, handout that we use that we take folks through this when we're at their Gimba to see the alignment, to have you know, the, the visual, does everybody know what that true north is? But this was my personal example while I was at Toyota and I used one of my roles. I was a problem solving instructor for Toyota North America. So my role to answer that question, I was an instructor. As you go up, my work responsibility for that was to learn that process. That was a new process again in, in 2004 to practice that you know, we always had what's called demonstration of knowledge. So it wasn't just about taking the class. It was about showing my, my what I learned and, and the tangible from that, that I was going to be able to coach this. So learn, practice the, the problem solving and how to weave in our, our Toyota way or anyone's company values to deliver the training session. So if that was my work responsibility, then what is my job's purpose? What's the purpose of, of, I'll bring that back up in case somebody's needing to see the, the, the second one. So my job's purpose, and I underline it because it's a little bit subjective. People have asked me, Tracy, how do you know you're effective? You know, I want to effectively to try to deliver any session, coaching, uh, mentoring, uh, gimbal walk, whatever we do to, to any cross, you know the vertical and horizontal which you see the the administration engineers production you can say accounting you can say hr all of the functional areas some folks call those silos but to train in a consistent to everybody to see the same lens effectively now how do i define effectively i try to bring out in the goals that guide my job's purpose. So my purpose is to effectively train to the best of my ability. I'm always leading and learning with folks. So to the best of my ability, the goals that guide me is for everyone within any organization. Again, this was what I had written at Toyota. I have not changed this at all. Um, but you can massage the words to meet the expectation of, of your company. But everybody in the company 
and, and you know, all those vertical uh, roles to first understand, and that goes back to getting buy-in and purpose, then to allow practice, demonstration of knowledge with a coach and, and a mentor if possible, and then look at the next level. As I'm learning, our trainers would say, you should always leading and, and learning, be leading and learning simultaneously. So sometimes we're learning and we're leading at the same time. And I wanted to weave this into my role because I'm always a learner. We should always be in that mode, but oftentimes we have to also lead. And so understanding how to make the values of your company tangible. For us, we had the, the five Toyota Way values, and that helps support the long-term growth and sustainability that leads you up to what is the true north for your company or your company goals. Some people would say mission or vision. This was Toyota, the, the August 1st, 88 date I talked about, you know, customer first, producing the highest quality product at the lowest cost and the shortest lead time in the safest manner, all while respecting people. That has baked into it all of our KPIs, including the customer, including people development. So it was always a measurable, that was always our guide to have what we did going all the way back to our our daily work, and I'll slowly scroll back down just to give you the full picture. My daily work as a problem solving instructor, I could connect it to what the company was trying to accomplish through asking myself these questions. So I just wanted to, to share this and as my example uh, of going through the questions uh, in this PowerPoint uh, to show you this was a, a very uh, integrated part of our culture internally at Toyota for leaders to, to understand how they make that connection all the way up, that cascade all the way up to the true north. It was very, very insightful for me to walk through that. And it looks easy when it's done, but as you're going through it to make those connections and the KPI translations, it can be uh, challenging. It makes you think a little bit. So when we talk about, you know, we, and we've touched on some of these already, these are just some, some bullet points for you guys. You know, if, if we can change wording, when we look at as our leadership role, you know, one of the, the courses I took for Toyota was worksite communication. And they taught us how to just change the wording. If I'm going to uh, lead with someone or, or talk at a process, I would, possibly in the past i may say you know why did this happen or why did we do this or, or what led to it and when you start that out with why did you um it can often turn defensive right and so they encourage us to to put that on ourselves and say you know how can i help um can can you help me understand the process do you mind taking the time you know, I work for you, help me provide the resources for you to remove those barriers and constraints. And, and that allows us to see it, learn it together. And that gets folks, you know, engaged, empowered in it when I'm asking from, this is on me to help and provide this for you, not why did you do? It opens up more for, for that buy-in and through the, the questions and, and that self-discovery learning versus me telling, going back to the sell, tell, and convince. And I think if we take the time, and you know that goes back to our poll question, um, oh, we don't have it, but if we take a little bit of time and understand how folks learn, there's different learning styles out there, and there's comfort zones that go along with that. You know, as a person that was hired into Toyota as an extreme introvert, you know, sometimes I wonder how I got past those tests, but the, my extreme introversion was a barrier for me in the beginning. And I had to push myself, nudge myself to be uncomfortable at, at all times, really to push past that, that zone that I like to feel that I was, you know, in my bubble, don't make me feel uncomfortable, nervous, have anxiety around it. And so seeing that in folks and understanding, they might not like to speak in front of others, but they're very articulate with visualization. So 
let them be a part of that and then nudge them in the other areas. You know, David Meyer, who co-wrote uh, the Toyota Talent and the Toyota Way Field Book along with Jeff Liker, he was the person who hired me. David hired me and he nudged me all the time and, and pushed me into, you know, the person it helped me be the person I am 32 years later, because if I would have said, hey, you know, get up and talk in front of a thousand people, it would have been, you know, I, I couldn't comprehend it in those days. So it's an iterative uh, learning for folks if we key into those learning styles. And I think we've covered uh, that last point again to not sell, tell, convince, but to engage, involve. I think if leaders can find that time and change the wording and understand, you know, sometimes resistance can just be uh, because folks are uncomfortable or not understanding that buy-in, you know, that is, I think, uh, key. So we've been through the COVID uh, uh, issue for the last several months, mostly around the world. So the question is now going forward, is, is it going to change us? Is it, how's the future going to look different? Uh, I actually uh, think that companies really have an opportunity here as they go back into uh, their their operations to set a culture because of, of what this uh, issue has done for us. It's set up by a short-term culture shift. And so when companies go back, they have an opportunity to actually build on that and be able to actually continue developing the culture. What I, what I know from past experiences and, and uh, and what we've talked about with some of our clients, even during this one, is most companies won't do that because they're back into firefighting as soon as they get back. Because they've been off so long, they've got to protect profitability, they've got to protect all these other aspects. And, and I understand that, but, but I really want them, what I'm really coaching them to is look in the future a little bit. What can we do right now that's going to have a huge impact, uh, you know, six months, a year, two years, or even 15 years from now? So how's it going to look moving forward? And are we going to purposely, because of the uh, uh, coronavirus, are we going to live differently? I think we will. I think there'll be changes that we will make, no matter what the result is on the on the lagging indicator. You know, so far most everybody's got to see leading indicators. What is the lagging indicator long term, and how will that change things? Uh, uh, and so I think I think it will. Uh, Will our businesses, uh, our leaders in our businesses do uh, do business differently? Will they look at Will they look at learning from this uh, experience and being able to say, can we do something a little bit different when we go back into our organizations? I, I always think about this from a leader's perspective. They have such a uh, control on the culture. Uh, so I think about the experience I had when I first become a manager at Toyota. And my trainer, uh, he had kind of, he set up this kind of thing every day. I had to meet with him before I could go home. And my, and my ticket to go home was I had to tell him three things. I had to tell him, one, who did I develop today in my organization? Two, how do I know? And the third was, what did I learn? And so that was the only thing, that was the only way I could go home and, and, and I first, when I first started doing that, I absolutely hated it. Matter of fact, I would try to figure out ways to get around it. But as I started doing it, it became easier and easier. And so as, as time went on, that became kind of the foundation of what I try to do every single day, even after my trainer is gone. Of who did I help improve today? Who did I help develop today? And that's the culture that we're constantly talking about. How do we keep... Uh, how do we keep people engaged into the, the, the lean journey, actually, because it is a journey, it's not a destination. And the last bullet point on here that I want to touch on is nothing is sustainable if we don't measure it. So even culture change, we have to come up with ways to measure how is our culture in our company? What's our, what's our uh, finger on the pulse? And if we don't do that, we will think we're doing really good, and many times we're just kind of... Uh, uh, staying still. We're pedaling, but we're staying still. We're just maintaining, which is not what we have most companies need to do in the long term. They have to actually have incremental improvements. We we always explain your company to stay to stay where they're at right now. They have to make more profit next year than this year and constantly the year after. And as employees of that company, we should be excited about that, getting the opportunity to help the company be able to do that. 
So I challenge you to actually, you've got to be able to come up with measurements to be able to say, what's my finger on the pulse for the culture? As, as our trainers ask us many times in our, our young days at Toyota, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know? And, and it was around everything from a micro perspective and just the action of one of our steps in, in our work all the way up to, to company level KPIs. How do we know the differentiation from what we think it is versus what is it? And, and so that how do you know is always something that will be within me for, for a long time. So as we bring you to the, the last slide, and it's just kind of a little bit of a summary of, of what we talk about in our book, you know, a lot of folks have asked us over the years, we, we've been at this, or I've been at this for, for 23 years. Ernie was still uh, working at the plant to retire, but he's been with me for, for seven now. And, you know, when we wrote the book, the, the Toyota Engagement Equation book, it was about, you know, telling our 30 year journey of learning basically, and how can we make that translatable with a little bit of uh, what I call math fun. You know, it looks like an equation up there that, that somebody has to figure out. But what we've done is to try to say, you know, it's not about uh, making cars. Yes, we learned this at Toyota, but from the cultural infrastructure that we were as people and the development side, you know, internally, we, we would say, you know, Toyota is a company that develops people that just happen to make cars. And I think this, this thinking around the formula, if you look at the GTSs, it's grounded around, you know, some of our values, but the, we always have to go to C. And each one of these are chapters that, you know, we really dig deep in and talk about, you know, how do we go to C? That's, that's a quick sentence people say, but what, what are the nuances around that? And once we're there, how do we grasp the situation? You know, ask questions around current state to standard, what's the abnormality and what, you know, how are we measuring that in order to get to the solution, the root cause, then the countermeasure in order for us to standardize. And, it, you know, going back to Ernie's comment, you know, we learned how to ask questions at the process with the owners of the process before we ever got the piece of paper out as the, the physical A3 as the tool, we learned the thinking behind it because standardization, we call that SDCA, Standardized Do Check Act, is actually the prereq to PDCA plan do check act so that get to standardization helps us get to sustainability or some can call it stability in order to get to that stretch that raise the bar mentality and that continuous improvement loop so this was our experience to say you know the gts's are very important and what we do is weave tbp the eight steps toyota business practices into the gts's and what that ends up looking at is that E3 or EQ is everybody or every day, everybody engaged. And, and you know, I even look at, at E5 now, I've evolved it since then, you know, to empower folks and have empathy for what they go through. So you can add two more E's, the empower and empathy there. And, and that, guys, is the equal sign to what we talk about in the, the DNA, the discipline and accountability for our culture. It, it resides with, with us and, and as influencers as, and leaders, that discipline. And this can be in your personal life. It could be in your professional life. And this was our way to write and, and tell our, our point in time with Toyota to say, here was our, you know, 30 year journey. If you read it, you're almost walking along with our learning, our failures, our trials and tribulations and, and our successes and our continued learning even today, not being employees, but actually translating this to, to other industry and, and it not be manufacturing. It does not have anything to do with making cars. It's, it's, it's developing people. So I know we went over a couple of minutes there, but uh, that, 
concludes what we want to talk about in in the, the PowerPoint part. And I don't know if we want to ask questions now and come back to this, Emma, this slide, I'll leave it up here, but, you know, kind of the contact, but however you guys want to start to do that process, we're, we're open. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in now. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, both Tracy and Ernie, for that uh, presentation. It's very uh, thought-provoking and um, certainly puts me in mind of some of my my own experiences as a young researcher in the early 90s, spending some time out with uh, Toyota in Japan. And I remember asking about 50 Toyota people, why is Okay, apologies for this, folks. We seem to have lost Peter. See if he will come back. A second, I thought I did something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so whilst Peter's just coming back, I'll just um, jump in and, and we have a few questions here for you, Tracy and Ernie. Um, so, the first one um, is from Lars, and he's asking, what do you tell a leader that find the servant leadership difficult because they feel they might lose power or respect? Yeah, we, we actually, that's that's probably a common question we get all the time. And, and many times what kind of sets that up is uh, sometimes the leaders have been promoted or got into that position because they're really good firefighters. And then when they get to that position and have to make a culture shift that doesn't fit real well with firefighters. And so what we explain to them is, okay, uh, we first try to coach them to say, you have to understand that your success individually and as a company come as other people are successful. So your direct reports have to be successful if you're wanting to be successful as a leader. And so uh, you can maintain that longer term by developing people than you can by being a firefighter. And then I think about our Japanese trainers would always say as a leader of, of your in any position when you're in a salary position, you have to lead like you have no power. Like it's the total opposite of what do I need to do from a company perspective, from a personal perspective to be able to support uh, the employees. And so I would tell you, I would say that it is a really difficult transition for folks in that position. And so what we try to get them into is showing them the purpose and the results of being able to make that. And so we can start them down the journey of being able to have that transformation. And, and honestly, most of the time when we, when we get them into that to be able to look at the data, we, we really don't have a long-term issue when they see that it's a safe zone and they don't have to worry about the job security. And, and to add just a real quick point to that, one of the things that we've, we've coached them to do and, and, and feel okay with saying, you know, a lot of times leaders feel like they have to have all the answers. You know, I know in certain points in, in my career, I felt as if I always needed to have a prepared answer or seem as if I know everything that's going on. And I learned that it's okay as a leader or a boss or all the different words we describe that a manager uh, an executive it's okay to to look at anyone that 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 you can say you know i work for you to say hey i don't have the answer to that right now but if it's okay with you let's go see it together and and try to to learn at the same time and and so it doesn't to me, it shows greater leadership that I'm willing to do that and learn with them than to come up with, you know, some answer that might seem, you know, at a surface level and never revisit the actual go and see. So that's that's been an approach that we've helped folks to say, it's okay not to know, go see it with them together. And that starts a mutual trust and respect relationship. Okay, thanks for that. Um, the next question is from Mohammed, um, who asks, how would you deal with very reactive people and unfortunate, unfortunately set on top of the company and resisting changes? 
So, so we always uh, we always kind of refer back to uh, the the right reaction should equal the data. And so, as Tracy talked about in the presentation, we have standards in place, and then we also have leading and lagging indicators. And many times, the reactions are are because of uh, the result is not where it is, and it's not the process that we're trying to control. And so, uh, change is hard. It's it's hard even in ideal conditions, but but the data tells us when we need to make change. It's not the other way around. We shouldn't be telling the data, and that's the the difference. Many people ask us the difference of of working at Toyota and and my experiences with other companies since I left Toyota, and I say it's really two things. Uh, first of all, we love problems, which is our culture. We we if we don't if we don't have problems, we'll find make problems. The second is we use leading indicators for almost everything. Obviously, we have we have lagging indicators we look at, but we the philosophy is if we use the right leading indicators, we don't have to worry about the lagging indicator. So I think as leaders understand and how we develop them is through one indicator at a time of, of this is going to be good for a company and good for our employees long term. And I, I, I think they kind of start coming over. But I think it is a journey. I don't think it's an overnight. It's not a light switch kind of thing. It happens. It's how do I how do I graduate? And I'll tell you some of my experience says when we make that transition with them, they're awesome leaders. They actually get both parts of it. They're being able to see the old uh, way they manage, and then and then also see the benefits of the new way. And they become very very strong leaders. And and you know when when folks. What I found, you know, personally myself, and and Toyota was pretty good with it, but Toyota's not perfect. You know, I'll, I'll say that people think it's, you know, a perfect environment. It's not. Sometimes, you know, if we don't explain the the purpose, the why, uh, and also do cost translations to KPIs to say, you know, if, if we go to sell tell model, sell tell convince. And, and you know, just here's what we need to do without getting that engagement or that buy-in or their involvement. Uh, that's where some of that you know can can creep in. So we found that if we just say, is is it okay if we take your time to help us look at the best way this process can be done? What's your ideas? And that's kind of how our trainers gave us a little leeway to say, this is your work. How can you best do it? Where do you see waste? And ask them and involve them. And as Ernie said, it's not going to go away overnight. But if I'm engaging with them and not telling them, but I'm asking, it can really start to change that that feeling that uh, that resistance is is kind of slowly turning into more of a, an engagement role if we have the discipline to encourage every day and be present and, and just say, how can I help? As Mr. Cho did us on a regular basis in the 90s, our president was on the floor saying, how can I help? And at first, you know, I saw that and I'm like, well, what's he doing down here? But it became a condition norm in a positive way. You, you knew if he was asking, there was gonna be action. And and that goes back again to the mutual trust and respect and the engage and involve, I think. Oh, okay, um, and everyone, and Tracy and Ernie, I'm um, just suffered a power cut here, but um, I think we're back online. Um, so I'm um, glad you continued on. Um, so what I was saying was that, you know, what I learned from Toyota in Japan in the, in the early when I asked why why do you feel you're so good we were using data from the machine that changed the world eighty nine and the answer they gave me was disciplined and rigorous application of the Toyota production system and I wrote down Toyota production system about forty eight times until I realized I wasn't actually writing down the what they were saying and eventually three months in they took it was the rigorous and disciplined application of that was probably the most important part, which very much echoes what uh, what you've been saying as well. So, thank you for that. So, uh, if we we got these questions, but we got a few questions coming in. Um, so, one that's actually from Lars and Mohammed's a very similar Peter, question. Peter, sorry to interrupt. We're, we've um, yep. gone through the questions, so we're up to Stephen's question okay. now. 
Okay. Right. Okay. So you've posed Stephen's question or not yet? Uh, we haven't. No, that's the one we're up to now. Okay, good. So Stephen's question, um, for leadership to practice GTS6, what of the day should they consider at the different management levels? So you, for for us and our speaker, you cut out in, in that a little bit, so I didn't articulate the, the whole question. Okay, it's um, for the leadership to practice the GTS 6, um, what percentage of their day they consider at the different management levels? So, so actually this is, uh, this is what we call uh, leadership standardized work. And so uh, I would tell you that this is geared into every part of your day. So there's no set uh, time period. So if you look at going up through the organization, uh, if you go to uh, uh, go to see, for an example, that's an expectation that we had at Toyota for all levels of organization. Uh, we we had a hard time saying get you gimbutsu, so we just said get your boots on. And what that means is everybody needs to be able to go see the problem, be able to see the opportunity. So it needs it's not really uh, segregated out in time. It should be immersed into everything you do as you go through the day and, and as you're going to see then it, then this is the cycle for what we're trying to do for the standard uh, leadership standardized work and and when when Ernie's talking about the leadership standardized work and and the go to see as you go through each one of these it reminds me you know when we wrote it, it I had to go back to, to 1988 in my you know young self and and say what was the doing before we called it lean, before you know all these things, and, and and you know to describe it that we have today, and and the grasping of the situation, I think that's vertical and horizontal. So when we talk about the verticalness of that, you know engineers need to do that, uh, the folks in accounting need to do that, HR needs to do that, you know manufacturing obviously R and D. But the, the three questions my trainer and Ernie's trainer, all of our trainers throughout the, the early time there, they would say, you know, there's three basic questions. And I covered some of these and, and they're, they're deeper than just the question. But when you talk about go see, how do we know the, the current state? You know, I can say, here's what's going on. But again, that question, how do we know? That should be an intrinsic uh, part of our day and our as a leader and even an influencer and even a process owner, I should be asking what's the current state, what should be happening that the internal and external customer needs it to be, and then how do we know from the measurability? And so that's a, not an add-on action, but part of our day, for us, it was hourly. We knew where we were hourly to the need of the day and as we got through, you know, I could walk through these GTSs without, quote, getting out an A3 or having to sit down and have a meeting. It became part of our questioning. You know, we have a, a handout we use in, in at the Gimbal with our, our clients. It's about 150 questions our trainers conditioned us to ask. And it's really about the thinking behind what a leader should be doing each day and the thinking behind how we form that A3 when we're ready for the A3. Do we even have a standard to ask against the, the current state? And so all those questions helped us support the tools later. You know, your culture has to be ready for those tools. And, and so the GTS is, was that invisible atmosphere I was talking about earlier that was in the air, how we asked questions, how we engaged, how we got to root cause, not just band-aid, what we thought the root cause was through a symptom, and then get to what the standard needed to evolve to from what we learned. And a lot of that didn't require, oh, stop, we've got to do this tool. You know, the tool was later to share our wisdom. The A3 was only created to share our wisdom on paper. It's like extrapolating your thoughts and putting them on paper. That was the only reason we did A3s. A lot of times you hear folks saying, oh, I got to do an A3, and it's like the penalty box. 
and and it's sad because the A3 is so valuable if it's shared wisdom of the questions that we ask and how we tell our story of how we solved it. And so it's more of a cultural question engagement with the work at any functional area uh, to, to be present and, and ask those questions. So I hope that answered. Um, there's a long answer, but I, I know there's a lot culturally around that. Okay, so I think we've lost Peter again, so I'll just um, continue on. So we have one more question uh, from Ed, which is, is due north and having a clear line of sight the same as ensuring everyone works towards the mission? I would say, and, and Ernie may have, have thoughts on this, but I would say, yes, we've seen different wording around a true north or a mission statement or a vision statement. I think consistency around that wording of, you know, what are we trying to accomplish from a, a company standpoint for the customer and for us as the folks doing the work, you know, the people development side, the people engagement side. Uh, Mr. Cho always called that our guiding beacon. You know, if we could see and connect our work to our, our guiding beacon, then then we're understanding our role if you go back to the line of sight questions in the example i showed we're understanding our our role in in maybe a uh, if you look individually we should we understand our work how that supports our team and understand our, our kpis at a team level and then visualize our department level kpis how are we making that cascade connection and then yes ultimately how do we connect to those, the vision, mission, or true north? And again, sometimes that's semantics. We tended to call it true north uh, or company goal, uh, but it was that guiding beacon. And so I think any wording, as long as it's consistent, as long as it's known and understood, and we make connections to it from, from a visual standpoint and from a, a cascading catch ball where where I can actually see my granular KPI in my process connect up to how I'm contributing to the, the organizational KPI in daily management and in Hoshan Connery. That's you know really your ideal state. And and probably one last thing I want to add, and and we can see if there's any you know last things we want to talk about. And I've I've talked uh, once on this. Uh, and I think it's in, in the book as well. You know, a lot of folks understand Toyota Production System or TPS, you know, as that. And over the years, the, the generation of that word has, has kind of evolved, even from the Toyota Japanese perspective and from, you know, just internally. So Gen 1, Generation 1 is TPS, Toyota Production System. And then the trainers started saying, you know, it's more about the T stands for thinking. Let's look at it at Gen 2 as the thinking production system. It's really about how we think every day and that cultural aspect. And then we looked at uh, the Generation 3 come about not too long ago that we saw thinking people system. And that's where, you know, from our book perspective, the evolution of this formula, it doesn't have to be uh, making cars to work. And, and TPS Gen 3 is really about, you know, how you look from a cultural standpoint, how do people think in, in a system that's driven by this true north and that we're measuring to specific level KPIs all the way up. We call that FMDS, Floor Management Development System. How do we visualize that is, is can be the beauty uh, of all that. So I wanted to share the, the TPS generation change of how we describe that because it's grounded at Toyota, but it's so much more when you talk about the cultural, the people side of, of that development and, and that culture, it's very translatable. 
Okay, thank you very much, Tracy and Ernie. So um, we've reached the end of the questions. Um, thank you very much for a great presentation. I am now just going to quickly launch um, a poll. If you're able, um, please, the audience, to rate this webinar. Um, we really do appreciate all feedback that we have. Um, and apologies for the slight technical issues. Um, I think it's just a common internet problems. Um, if you'd like to um, view more of our webinars, you can visit our website um, where you can see the upcoming webinars which are happening every couple of weeks. And um, you can also view this webinar video recording there as well, which will be uploaded tomorrow. If you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to email me. Um, you'll have my email on a follow up um, email after this webinar. So thank you very much um, and take care. Thanks, Tracy and Ernie. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everyone. Have a good morning, afternoon, or evening.